Well, just recently I got an advanced copy of a survey that will come out in um, an edition of American Magazine pretty soon. And it's by uh, William J. Byron, the former president of Catholic U, and Charles Zeck. And it was done at the instigation of David O'Connell, who's the Bishop of Trenton. And Bishop O'Connell had a um, very simple question he wanted them to look into. Why are Catholics leaving uh, the church? No one denies that in the last oh, 20, 25 years, uh, lots and lots of Catholics have left. I've said before, the second largest religion in America would be ex-Catholics. So Bishop O'Connell uh, said, look, let's try to find out. So the survey uh, asks as directly as possible, it addresses those who have left and said, why? So uh, it's a very helpful, interesting uh, look. No matter what you think about the reasons that people give, uh, there they are. There's the reasons that are uh, in their minds. And what struck me first was a fair amount of it was, um, was predictable. People said things like, uh, you know, gay marriage, uh, divorce and remarriage, contraception, women's ordination, a lot of the sort of hot button issues. And, you know, I'd be willing to bet anybody, even vaguely associated with the church over the past, you know, 50 years, could rehearse the arguments pro and con on those issues. And more to it, let's be honest, are just things that the church, certainly at the local level, just can't do very much about. I mean, no uh, parish priest or no bishop is going to say suddenly, oh yeah, uh, gay couples come to be married, uh, yes, uh, you know, we'll ordain women in the priesthood. So those are things that really can't be addressed um, directly. But you know what struck me about the survey was the number of things that, that can be addressed, things that were really bothering people or on their minds, given as reasons why they left, that can indeed um, be addressed. Here's the first category, what I call uh, bad customer relations. So a lot of people left because they were just treated poorly by church leaders, by church officials, uh, by priests. I'll give you a couple quotes. Uh, one woman said she just felt undervalued by the church. Another one, in fact, many people echoed this in the survey, found their pastors arrogant, distant, aloof, and insensitive. A number of people, too, commented that uh, parish personnel often were very unhelpful, meaning, you know, over the phone, parish staffers they would contact who were just uh, unkind or indifferent to them. Now, what I was reminded of was my first pastor, who was a great man, Father Joe Kinane, he's been dead now for about 10 years. But Joe, I remember one day, I'm a young priest, and he was talking to the parish secretary. And he said to her, you know, you're the first contact a lot of people will have with the Catholic Church. And so you perform an indispensable ministry as you answer the phone. And I remember, I don't know if she was struck by it, but I was struck by it, that he was absolutely right. That ministry of, you know, hello, this is St. Paul of the Cross Parish, uh, was a very important one and how we deal with people in those simple ways. And so what struck me was uh, this is a problem that can be solved. I mean, I get it. A lot of pastoral people would say, Look, I'm in the front lines, and so when the church has to say no to people, either for kind of theological or practical reasons, I'm the one in the front lines. And it's, you know, maybe all too easy for someone to say, oh, you're arrogant and aloof and difficult when you say no to me. So, I mean, I get all that. Nevertheless, um, I think priests and parish staffers, those who work for the church, can realize that, you know, simple kindness, simple compassion um, can go an awful long way toward uh, reconciling people to the church or keeping people connected. Here's a second one uh, that I think can be addressed, and a lot of people mention it in the survey. Bad preaching. Um, I'll give you a quote again here. Uh, people found sermons very often boring, irrelevant, and poorly prepared. Now, first of all, uh, as someone who preaches a lot, someone involved in seminary training, I can tell you preaching is difficult. Um, it brings together so many different skills. I mean, to preach well, you have to know a lot about public speaking. You have to know a lot about the Bible and how to interpret it. You have to be able to read the culture well. You have to be sensitive to the needs and, and interests of a very diverse uh, public. So I know preaching is difficult. Nevertheless, we find this complaint now over and over again that bad preaching is driving people away. Here's one thing I would say now about ameliorating our preaching. 
I think preaching becomes boring in the measure that it doesn't correlate question to answer. What I mean is, you can have all the skill in biblical interpretation in the world, you can have all the theology in the world, but if you don't bring that to bear in such a way that it appears as an answer to a question, that homily is going to be boring to people, no matter how clever you are, how bright you are. The homily should be a moment when the question coming up from the depth of the human heart meets the great answer proposed by the Bible and by the theological tradition. Look at um, story after story in the Gospels. What do you find? But an encounter, an encounter between Jesus and somebody who is questing or wondering or searching or suffering. Think of you know, Zacchaeus or the woman at the well or Peter at the miraculous draft of fishes or uh, the disciples uh, at the Last Supper. I mean, whatever it is, there's an encounter with a sort of questing, longing, aching human heart and Jesus, the answer. A good homily, and here I guess I'm hoping priests and deacons and bishops are listening to me, is a good homily is one that brings question and answer um, together. Here's a third thing now that came up in the survey. Eminently addressable problem, and one I must confess to you that I, I never thought of before I read the survey. But a lot of people said, you know, I left the church, I left the parish, and nobody called me, nobody wrote to me, no one contacted me from the parish. And so they said, eh, what the heck with it. They don't care about it. They don't even know I'm there. Now, again, I know Catholic parishes are big. Some of them 3,000, 4,000 families. I know pastoral staffs are small and overworked, so I know how difficult this can be. But you know what struck me when I read the survey was? Huge corporations, I mean, serving millions of customers, they're very attentive to customer relations. They are very alert to the problem of people no longer using their product, right? If someone's drifted away from using their product, they'll find out and they'll contact them. Well, heck, if, if corporations serving millions can do that, I don't see why a parish can't do it. And, you know, it's relatively simple. Um, notice when somebody has left, send an email, send a note, make a phone call, at best make a pastoral visit, and ask some simple questions. You know, hey, we, we miss you. We've noticed you're not at Mass anymore. Um, can we help with anything? Uh, have we done something wrong that we could uh, help you with or change? Uh, we'd love to have you back. I don't know how difficult that would be for a parish in a very concrete way to follow up with people and then be willing to sit down and really listen to them. So, you know, it's an interesting um, experience reading the survey. Again, a lot of things that we probably can't directly um, solve or address. And, of course, the problem is a difficult one. Everyone knows that. It's a, it's a complex issue, a lot of reasons why people leave. But I, I found the survey kind of encouraging in a certain way because it convinced me there are some things, very concrete, very simple, very practical things, that we can do right now that would go actually a long way toward um, improving the situation.